This Real Egg Radio podcast is brought to you by Corrigin Max Insecticide from FMC. Get fast, selective, extended control of grasshoppers, Bertha armyworms, diamondback moth, and cutworms in a convenient, concentrated formulation. Corrigin Max Insecticide works alongside beneficials for a one-two punch that keeps the fight going long after you've left the field. It's time for Real Egg Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Hello and welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and it is Friday, April 26th. And yes, Sean Haney is away today, so I get to sit in the host seat and two exciting things. Not only do I get to chat with Ann Wasco uh, for the Beef Market Update, but I also get to host the Issues Panel for today's show. Yes, it is Friday, so we're going to talk about the biggest stories of the week, and we've got some good ones in the lineup. Uh, Kelvin Hepner will be joining me for that, as well as Sherilyn Jolly Nagel. She farms out of Moss Bank, Saskatchewan. Uh, on the list, we're going to talk uh, about our Prime Minister being on the Freakonomics podcast and uh, what we learned there about perhaps his character and some of his outlooks and, and policies as well. We're going to talk about productivity in Canada. We're also going to talk quite a bit about equipment and machinery uh, because I've got some key questions there that happen to relate to our poll post that's over on realagriculture.com. Go check it out. Uh, have your vote. Have your say. Let us know what you think. Uh, as always, if you've got feedback on today's show, if you've got follow-up questions, all those sorts of good things, you can drop us a line, 855-776-6147, or you can zip me an email lsmith at realagriculture.com. We are going to jump straight into a quick break and then we're going to kick off the show with the Beef Market Update with Ann Wasco right after this. It's now time for a product spotlight. We're joined by Jody Griffin, Program Coordinator for the Livestock Price Insurance Program. Why should producers purchase an LPI policy? You know, listening to you and Anne over the last couple of weeks on the, those market reports, because LPI is a forward-looking market-driven program, that type of news also set that back on the price insurance. At the beginning of March, you could buy calf coverage at $394. Well, now we're down to that $366 range. And if the message has got to be sent to say anything, it's that now is not the time to get complacent when we're in this type of environment. This tool is as important as we always say it is, but I would say it's even more important. And I just need to remind these producers that LPI is about the best defense you can have against a border closure threat. Price insurance, it's about protecting the down in the market. Make sure everybody go to lpi.ca to find out more Choose Viatude Fungicide and unleash best-in-class sclerotinia protection in canola and premium protection against white mold in soybeans. Viatude contains a powerful premix of Onmira Active and Prothioconazole. This unique combo delivers high-performance disease control, crop safety, mix compatibility, resistance management, and advanced mobility for excellent coverage and superior plant protection. Choose Viatude Fungicide for stronger, more vigorous crops. Back to Real Egg Radio here on this Friday, April 26th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, here on Sirius XM, Rural Radio, Channel 147. This segment of Real Egg Radio is brought to you by Livestock Price Insurance. Cattle markets are destined to rise and fall. Make sure you're protected from unexpected price drops with Livestock Price Insurance. Price protection for calves is available now through to June 13th. For more information, visit lpi.ca. Joining me now for this week's Beef Market Update, it's Ann Wasco of the Gateway Livestock Exchange. Ann, how are you? I am great, Lindsay. Very good here. How is your corner of Saskatchewan? Well, it's very, very warm, so spring is definitely here. Uh, we haven't seen those spring rains yet, um, so we're still working off of uh, the snow from 
from last month, but uh, it's gone, the gone, but we're still working off the moisture from that. So that, I, I guess things are good, but we're always looking to the skies here. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we'll see if we can send some your way. Uh, let's talk uh, cattle markets. Let's start as we do in the south, in the U.S. What uh, what happened this week? Well, it kind of steady to better um, in terms of cash cattle. So in Texas and Kansas, that southern trade, we talk about traded at 182, which is steady with last week. In the north, the uh, <clears throat> Nebraska areas were 185. That's probably going to average about two bucks higher than last week. So that's that's good news. That choice cut out, and here we're going to finish off April 297. That's a buck higher than last week. It's still a very narrow choice select spread. Last night it was about seven bucks a hundred. We most are still expecting this cutout to get up over three hundred dollars uh, as we head into May and June for those holiday, you know, good grilling dates as we head into, um, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day, you know, the Memorial Day weekend. All those, you know, still tend to be good beef weekends. So we're we've got all our fingers crossed that that's still ahead of us. The other point I just wanted to bring up on the U.S. market was last Friday, um, we had a U.S. April 1 cattle on feed report, and it was friendly in terms of what the market was expecting. Placements in March were down 12%. Marketings, though, in March were down 14%, Mm. so that with fewer cattle getting placed but fewer getting marketed, it still left the on-feed number 1% above a year ago. And if you recall, we talked about our Western Canadian report now we're, you know, under 2% under a year ago. So U.S. is still, they're going to get there as we move through the second quarter, but it's taking longer for the U.S. to get to smaller on feed numbers than a year ago. So that good news really helped when we started off Monday of this week, really helped futures. It was a kind of a friendly report, smaller placements, and, and the board really responded. But since then, Lindsay, it's mm. really been the stories swirling around bovian influenza or H. PAI really causing lots of volatility in the futures market. So it started off with a good week, but we've ended off on on uh, some you know tougher news, um, especially um, if you want to talk right now about the the yeah. announcement last night about Colombia. Yeah. So yeah. So started strong on our the you know friendly reports and all those sorts of great things. Uh, but as you mentioned, definitely it has been a week of you know further news on the HPI uh, front in the U.S. And yes, um, there were rumors swirling earlier in the week, but we did get the news yesterday that that Colombia, now I will ask, so Colombia is saying no to beef right now out of the U.S. Um, Tell us more about this, sort of what what this announcement is, and then yes, what impact it's had on the market so far. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, now that we have confirmed news, it's better than a rumor because all yeah. week it was yes it is no it isn't kind of thing so here it is but <clears throat> so it's restricting imports for beef and beef products coming from u.s states that have dairy cows that have tested positive so okay. it's not all states um they are not a big importer as you can right. imagine but again you know just just the fact that um, a country has moved to this point the other thing you know u.s uh, da announced is they're going to on Monday, this coming Monday, start requiring any dairy cattle moving between states to be tested for AI. Right. So certainly they're they're getting um, more aggressive in terms of containing the spread. Just for the numbers right now, it's been reported in eight states and 33 dairy herds. You know, and going back to the first one that was detected, that was late March back in Texas. So mm-hmm. that's kind of how the news is sitting. And maybe in, in this case, I've always said, you know, unknowns are worse than knowns. So now we can get this rumor put to, to bed and uh, on to onto some confirmed news. The market deals better with confirmation of news than rumors. Right. And and so, and maybe just to back up a bit, I mean, this isn't, as you mentioned, Columbia is not a huge market. Uh, it's saying, you know, not from these, it's not going to bring in beef from these states that have positive cases. Um, yes, these are dairy herds, but of course, dairy cattle will end up as beef. Um, so there's mm-hmm. a lot going on there. But at the same time, as you mentioned, you know, a, a fact at times being better than a rumor. Does this, though, sort of shed light on some of the uncertainty that can add that volatility? I mean, that this isn't a good news story per se. So overall, just this negativity, is that weighing on on cattle markets? 
overall? For Oh, for sure. And I guess the other obvious, you know, query will be, you know, first Columbia, who could it possibly mm-hmm. be next? You know, the U.S. Meat Export Federation came out with a, a statement as well. And, you know, again, disappointing because this really doesn't have any scientific basis mm-hmm. um, in terms of this import restriction. So anytime a border issue revolves around really not a strong scientific piece, we as Canadians know that storyline well, um, that's always very frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we, we did put up uh, just a quick note. Uh, there is our latest story is on com. We are following along. Of course, we've been asking CFIA uh, sort of what it's doing on the Canadian side. As of right now, no positive cases confirmed in Canadian dairy uh, cattle or beef cattle that CFIA has reported and which, of course, they will if there is one. Um, so yeah, so we are following the story, of course, uh, seems to be a much larger US story. But of course, we are fully integrated in our beef system. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, exactly. now um, we are positive people, I think, Anne. And so <laughs> let's switch gears from the perhaps gray cloud to more sunshine here with the prices oh, in Canada. I would love to. Yeah, let's do <laughs> this. That. Alberta fat cattle. Yeah, this Alberta fat cattle market is um, um, uh, outstanding, amazing, whatever word you want to use. Uh, this week we saw trade from 430 to 432 delivered dressed. Um, that is trade at the upper end of last week. So it's kind of how we ended last week. But because we've spent the whole week there, we are going to see when Canfax comes out with their average later today, it should be another all-time fat cattle high for Alberta. So last week, just for the record, was 256 and a half. Um, and at the same time, that also means that last week we were trading 5 bucks 100 over the U.S. market. Hmm. It wasn't long ago we were talking about 25 under. Right. So big change. And I think you'll see this week's average on top of 257. So we'll wait and see what they come out with. But um, that's that's good. The other thing, Lindsay, that happens when you've got this premium pricing going on in Western Canada, um, any cattle that can now be pulled forward. Yeah. It wasn't long ago we were talking about backlogs. Now we're pulling cattle forward. Weights are coming down. Weights are down. Steer weights are down 35 pounds since the start of the year. The five-year average is more like a 20-pound decline from Jan 1 to the end of April. So that's that's the other um, side of what happens when you pull fat cattle forward. Right. Now, there is a limit to that, though, right? I mean, you can only bring so much, but it definitely yeah. does pull it forward. Especially at this time of year, the second quarter, we're moving into our calf feds. Yeah. And they just they need time to finish, right, in yeah. terms of that grading piece. So, yeah, there's only so much, so much uh, especially on this class of cattle that we're moving into, that you can, you can pull them forward. But it, is, uh, it certainly goes from, you know, the piece of bigger cattle early, meaning more tonnage, today lighter cattle equals less tonnage. Mm-hmm. Okay. And last question then. That's a pretty... Uh, it seems like anyway a pretty large reversal uh how did we how did we in one quarter go from from this to that like <laughs> it does seem like we were just talking about the exact opposite so what what has factored into this well one of the things we've seen and Sean and I talked a little bit about it 2 weeks ago is lots of cattle when you get into that big negative basis you tend to have to ship cattle further to get them marketed and so we saw lots of exports of fat cattle through January, it picked up in February, and it picked up even more in March. So once those cattle are cleared through the system and there wasn't anything behind them because we've had these smaller placements in recent months, then all of a sudden you go from too many cattle to now we're super current. Mm -hmm. Okay. Super current. Uh, the Mm -hmm. uh, The best superhero out there. Okay. We'll leave it there for this Beef Market Update. We'll be back, of course, in two weeks to do another. And maybe it'll be you and me again, Anne. Maybe. Okay, that's great. I don't mind at all. Uh, me? Well, good, because I don't either. Okay, thanks so much, Anne. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Let's take a quick break, and I will be back with the Issues panel featuring Sherilyn Jolly Nagel out of Saskatchewan and Calvin Hepner out of Manitoba right after this. Peter Johnson at WheatPeakRealAgriculture.com and what an opportunity! Oh my gosh! You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Beats Word every Wednesday on RealAgriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. 
Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom, with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Friday, April 26th. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and this segment is brought to you by the new Oxbow Cereal Broadleaf Herbicide from New Farm. Oxbow is powered by Duplassan technology that is a workhorse on resistant kochia and other tough weeds in wheat and barley. You know who knows about kochia? One of our issues panel guests, Sherilyn Jolly Nagel, is here from <laughs> Mossbank, Saskatchewan. How are you, Sherilyn? How did you know that we have, we have one or two kochia? One or two. Feet? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, just I'm just smart like that. Uh, and also joining us, of course, is Calvin Hepner, who has also never heard of Kosha out of Altona, Manitoba. How are you, Calvin? I'm doing well. And no, I've, I've never seen a Kosha before. Oh. And they're, they're not growing in our field or field already. <laughs> already. Yeah, well yeah. ahead of it of any crop you may decide to put in the ground. Um, okay, we have so much to cover and we've only got three segments, so we're gonna dive right in. Uh, I subjected Sherilyn to uh, a terrible thing yesterday. I made her uh, listen to a Freakonomics podcast that I will blame Calvin for, because he's the one who sent it around. So, uh, but Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was on the Freakonomics podcast a whole hour of uh, learning all about, uh, you know, how he feels about how he's doing as prime minister and his philosophy on it. Sherilyn, thank you for taking one for the team. Uh, what did you think of our prime minister? Yeah, I was unimpressed with you to, to send me that. There's just, I mean, it's, it's aside from the actual content, there's just something about Justin Trudeau's voice that really bothers me. I can't stand it. Plus, it wasn't an hour listen to me for me because I always have my podcasts on at like 1.5. Me too. <laughs> you know, his ums and his ridiculous pauses were shortened somewhat for me because mm -hmm. that's how I listen. But it was actually a bit surprising. I went into it super negative thinking I'm not going to love anything that he says. But there was some decent things about, uh, you know, in there. I actually, It was a reminder that he wrote a book. Yeah. You remember that? Like back yeah. in 2014, you know, his, his face is on the front cover, as you would expect. Common Ground was the name of the book. And I kind of went back and flipped through some of the pages of that, you know, the historic history with him and his family and his dad, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, so I don't know. I can't say there was a total waste of my time, if I'm being honest. So, Calvin, I think what was interesting, though, I was... A Sherilyn, also surprised to remember that he wrote a book, and it was very much sort of a, a campaign launching kind of book. Um, but Kelvin, he did actually mention agriculture. He mentioned TFWs. And I was surprised. He actually, I think, got it right in his understanding of how important TFWs are to Canadian agriculture. Yeah, you're right. Uh, he, there was a fair bit of discussion around immigration in Canada having this unprecedented level of immigration and whether that's actually working. And Trudeau made the argument to uh, the host on, on the podcast, Stephen Dubner, that uh, it does work in Canada and that Canada is a successful example of immigration. I, I think that there are some areas where we obviously are seeing uh, cracks in, in the system or things that need patching up and repairing, especially on the housing side of things, the healthcare side of things. But he talked about temporary foreign workers, how that is one of the areas along with university students. That's where we've seen a lot of uh, this immigration happen or the increase in the Canadian population happen. And he did make that differentiation of how important TFWs are in agriculture and how that needs to be treated separately from the massive increase in TFWs that we've seen in retail and service sector and accommodations and, and other areas where companies, McDonald's drive throughs are being worked by, by TFWs. I, I think there is a bit of a concern here in, in our industry, though, of where that line is drawn, whether processing plants that are essential for value add for our agricultural commodities, whether they get treated under the agriculture category or whether they get treated together with other industries, that's where I think it could be a concern. But I think this also explains why there's been a bit of a discrepancy between different uh, commodity organizations, stakeholder groups that we've been talking to on the farm side of things. We've heard 
not a lot of concern about government cracking down or clamping down on TFW numbers, but on the processing side of things, people are quite concerned. And I wonder if that's because of where that line is going to be drawn. Overall, that interview, though, I, I there's a lot of flaws and reasons to be critical of our prime minister. One thing that I've maybe just realized the last couple months, he is stubborn. Like he mm. is, and, and maybe that's a quality to admire. He's persevering in terms of doubling down on his position on a lot of things, despite it costing him hugely politically. Like a lot of the th- ideas that the liberals implemented earlier on in their mandate or in their administration have not succeeded. They have not executed well on, on them. And that's why a lot of Canadians are upset and, and looking mm-hmm. for alternatives. But he's standing by and sticking with them and still talking about how government can be the solution in a lot of areas, how he's actually a social activist acting as prime minister, all those types of messages. He's He hasn't changed his message. Mm-hmm. Which I think, you know, for, for many people, um, you know, it, you sort of shake your head and think like, so a positive way to put it, Calvin, is that he's, you know, persistent or principled or stuck. At the same yep. time, it, there also seems to be this break from the reality of everyday Canadians that, you know, he's got it in his head what he wants to do, even though uh, the results have not been what we, you know, what he, I would think, would want. Um, and most Canadians are telling, you know, through the polls, Sherilyn, most Canadians are saying this isn't what we want, and yet he's sticking by it. So there is also that that sort of head scratcher moment of, are you actually listening? So is this is this a positive? I don't know. Yeah, I agree with Kelvin. You went all in on, in his defense of immigration. What was the quote? You can invite a half a million people into your house if you're Canada. I think yeah. that's what he said. Yeah. And you know, there's some excerpts from his from his book. That was is very much a premonition of what was to come. Had had I read the book in 2014, it was pretty clear that that was the direction he was going to go. Uh, I don't know if it was always going to be to this extent, but he did break down those immigration numbers. I mean, a half a million people coming into Canada. Like he said, we had 40 mil, that we that we're at 40 million in Canada. I thought our population was still at like 37 million, but that percentage wise is huge. And then he broke that down. There was 700,000 uh, international students coming in. And there's some, you know, some some horror stories around that piece as well. And then 750,000 temporary foreign workers. That's a big number. I mean, I was a little bit shocked by that number, too. And I didn't fact check it. I assume he might have some accurate information. But that's a really big number. Mm-hmm. So in the yeah. something that just before we went live, I, I just I was checking some of my social feeds and uh one of my friends here in ontario his son is pursuing uh welding and and uh some of these sought after jobs of course that and things that we have gaps in our industry in canada uh he just his son got a letter to say guess what we're shutting down this particular program at fanshawe college Uh, I think this is the beginning of, and we're going to follow up on this, it is the beginning of what we may see for our colleges and universities as far as the impact of our government saying, okay, international students, you're, I mean, they're slashing how many are going to be allowed in. I think we have probably not realized how much those dollars were being used to support programs uh, that potentially are going to get cut here very quickly. Uh, This is going to be pretty ugly in the next little while, uh, which of course probably is not going to bode well for the current government either. Not that they're doing great, but uh, let's, let's shift gears. We've got a bit of time in this segment left to talk about how that conversation and how, you know, Trudeau's uh, plans, uh, his outlook on what he's, you know, done for Canada or not done in eight or nine years, um, how that might dovetail into productivity. And this is, it's a little too bad that Sean Heaney couldn't be on today's show because this is one of his favorite uh, topics is how Canada has sort of lost its way on prioritizing productivity. And Calvin, we saw, uh, this week in the Globe and Mail, we've actually got some hard numbers that would back that up. What? Uh, how bad are we at being productive here in Canada? Yeah, so the Globe and Mail has reported on this uh, new StatsCan data that was released on Wednesday. Uh, basically, they've looked at long-term productivity, uh, GDP per capita trends in uh, in Canada, and how uh, over the last number of years we have slipped. We are now 7% below the long-term trend, which amounts to a decline of roughly $4,200 per person 
in uh, in how far off we are right now in terms of per capita GDP output in uh, in this country. So some numbers definitely showing. And I think this ties in very well with that discussion we heard with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and some of the interviews he's been giving in, in terms of what his priorities are. Productivity has not been a priority of uh, of this federal government as much as maybe they're trying to backtrack on that now uh it has not been and and so it's it's been a struggle and and we're uh yeah we're, we're seeing the numbers here from stats canada hard hard proof of uh, what this is doing to and of course per capita gdp isn't a, a perfect measure but it's a good proxy one of the better proxies for uh, standard of living and, and quality and in terms of uh what the average canadian has and so yeah, that's uh, that's a, a, ma- a major concern. Another thing I was going to quickly say about his interview sh- uh, with uh, with the Freakonomics host, Trudeau said that the biggest problem facing Canada is that young people feel the mm-hmm. economy is doing isn't doing well. He he basically said it's, it's the problem with how people feel, and to me that sense of con that there's. There's some yeah. condescension in that, uh, in in implying that somebody else's feelings are are wrong, and uh, and there isn't yeah. a sense of self awareness of, of that feeling, and, and I just that I think is one of the main reasons why the liberals and why he is under such criticism right now. He there's a lack of that self awareness when it comes to, and maybe that ties in with that stubbornness, that perseverance, but. There's a, a condescension when you imply that millennials and Generation Z or Generation Z, uh, your feelings are, are misplaced in, in how the economy is doing. So, well, Sherilyn- isn't that why he's spending so much money, you know, on an adver- on advertising campaigns to address millennials specifically and Gen Zs specifically? Because they simply, if they just only understood me, if I just only sent the right marketing message to them, then they would be on board. It's very much along the same lines as you're talking, Kelvin. It's they don't feel the economy is working for them, yeah. but just if I give them the facts, then they'll come on board. But but like to that uh, end, how well that works. yeah, exactly. Well, to that end, though, Sherilyn, how do you feel about what we're doing with productivity? Because you can feel any way you want. Numbers don't lie. So you know we can you can say the problem is is how they feel about it. But when the numbers back up, perhaps that negative perception, well, maybe that's true then. You know, I'm not an economist. And so when I read through those reports like the Globe and Mail, I have a hard time figuring out what exactly this means. Does that mean I just need to get up earlier? Do we all need to join the 5 a.m. club to be more productive? Is it our phones? And then I can't help but go back to the Canada West Foundation did a report on the poor you know, funding to infrastructure that Canada has, the lack of infrastructure funding. And I think our infrastructure, at least especially here out West, trying to move product, agriculture products and otherwise, all the way across the country and then to the economies it needs to go, we just haven't put in enough money into infrastructure. So how does that, I can't make sense of how that correlates into individual productivity for Canadians. I will. And it and we're going to take a break here quickly and we have more to cover, but it also this is probably one of those. Hey, let's talk about this for the rest of the week. Um, There's also the question of what we discussed last week with the changes to the capital gains uh, taxes that are coming. How do you encourage productivity, encourage companies to expand or invest, et cetera, when they know down the road what you build, the government is going to take more of as you pass along next and next and next. So. Does that, do we already, are we building in intrinsic productivity roadblocks just through the policies that we're putting into place? Um, We have to take a break, but Kelvin, maybe we can answer that when we come back. And then we're going to tackle everybody's favorite topic, uh, machinery, egg equipment. All right, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more on Real Egg Radio right after this. Dad, we missed the window for a PGR in our cereals. Why didn't you add it to the herbicide? What? With manipulator PGR, we can apply as early as one tiller. Just add it to the herbicide. No separate pass. Don't miss out. Manipulator PGR is proven in wheat, durum, barley, and oats to shorten plants and even out the main stem and tillers. This results in reduced lodging risk, improved harvest efficiency, and increased yield. Talk to your crop protection retailer for more info and to confirm acceptable tank mixes. 
Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on The Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on this Friday Issues Panel. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and the answer to your above-ground nitrogen loss problem is Anvil Nitrogen Stabilizer from Coke Agronomic Services. To learn how Anvil's dual active ingredients deliver extended protection, visit cokeag.ca. Joining me on today's Issues Panel, we've got Sherilyn Jolly-Nagel out of Moss Bank, Saskatchewan, and Kelvin Hefner out of Altona, Manitoba. Kelvin, you have thoughts. And so let us share those thoughts. So let's pick up where we left off. We're talking about productivity. What does a productive Canada even look like? I think the question you asked going into the break was a rhetorical question, Lindsay, in terms of this government hasn't focused on productivity at all. I know I already said that before, but it, uh, it's been low in terms of priorities. There's been all kinds of other priorities when it comes to policies being implemented. And so now we have this culture of, not actually looking at efficiency or yield increase. Look at agricultural research just as an example and how now it's it's a high priority to have uh, climate and emissions reduction uh, as part of your, uh, your research project and if you want federal funding, but not increase the, the idea of increasing yields and being more efficient on a per input basis isn't, uh, isn't the same there isn't the same focus on that, even though that is also good for reducing emissions overall. Mm-hmm. So that's where I think if we compare ourselves to the U.S., which we often do, the U.S. government agencies and administration often have a productivity or growth or promotion mandate built into mm-hmm. their function, into what they do. Here in Canada, our government, our bureaucrats are often extremely risk averse. And so there's a, a and we don't want to offend anybody and we want to make sure everybody feels safe. And I know there's been a huge emphasis on diversity, equity and inclusion and and all those types of social things, which there are reasons for that. But if it comes at the cost of everybody's standard of living dropping because of productivity decreasing, then we need to, I think, question how we balance these priorities. And and that's something that uh, is one of the reasons I, again, think the the political costs liberals are paying in the polls right now heading into uh, another federal election in the next year and a half. Uh, I think that's a big reason why. And and also young people's, again, their feelings of how the economy is working for them. I think a lot of this is tied to that. Yes. And... I, I also think that, you know, and actually I was surprised that the prime minister did, did, did re- really wave the flag for trade and that Canada is a trading nation. But you have to wonder what the spin-off ramifications are of Canada's lower productivity, because we we feed the world. That that's a fairly standard, you know, bumper sticker. But we also provide so much other energy sources, so many other products to the rest of the world. So if our productivity is going down, how long before the productivity of those other countries that need these products goes down as well? And how is that even measured? And it hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it hurts our competitiveness and. The other thing is we often like to compare ourselves again to the U.S., but we don't have the market size of the U.S., and so we can't have the same standards necessarily everywhere in terms of trying to attract investment and trying to attract businesses to the Canadian market. Look at what the government's having to do in the auto sector or EV sector in terms of trying to attract some of these plants to southern Ontario. Massive billions of dollars in tax breaks and and payouts. Uh, Canada, we don't have the same size of market, and so we can't just implement the same, we have to have other reasons for attracting investment and, and there hasn't been a focus on that. You mentioned trade, Sherilyn, that, that also hasn't been a, a priority in terms of boosting and growing exports through through trade with this uh, Liberal administration. And just throwing it out there, as Sherilyn mentioned, we have to get it to the customer. So we have to get it yeah. from <laughs> Saskatchewan or Manitoba or wherever, somewhere yeah, to the we're world. We're spread out yeah. over a thin band, yeah. very diverse, difficult geography in places. We don't have the concentrated population like some of the major U.S. markets. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's switch gears. As I promised, um, Sherilyn insists that we talk about 
machinery and equipment. Um, so, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> as you were seating, and thank you for taking your break from seating to uh, join us on the issues panel here. Uh, but let's start with okay, so we did, uh, we're just going to send a shout out. Head on over to realagriculture.com on the main page, scroll down, uh, you'll find our poll post um, there. And we're asking the question if uh, or how you're approaching equipment purchases this year, are you going to delay them? Uh, for several reasons are were you not planning to buy equipment anyway or are you staying the course and you're going to there's a few options there um the reason we're asking this of course is we've got a few things happening we've got some reports coming out that are looking at you know what the trend is uh, we often use equipment sales as sort of proxy for how the overall ag economy is doing um, but there's a whole bunch of factors at play here there's interest rates that have climbed um, there's prices of course our crop inputs have gone up our crop prices have gone down Sherilyn when you start to think about this question of you know the equipment purchase side uh, where would you fall? Do you think you have become more negative on on purchasing going forward and, or are you staying the course? What does it look like on your farm? Well, it, I mean, it, timing, I guess, is an issue, but it comes down to necessity. You can only operate most of the equipment that we have for so many years. You know, our combines are pushing nine or 10 years now, which is longer than we used to go. You know, we might have been a, a bit heavy on the two super shiny new equipment for a while. You know, it's just interesting for me to watch the differences between the price of new and the price of used. Um, rumor has it that Ritchie Brothers Auction won't be offering that low guaranteed price option anymore. And that to me is really telling. That that tells me that the auction you know, market is looking at at what's coming in the future and it may not be so great. Um, on the on the flip side of that, when you're looking at buying and, and having older equipment on the farm, you have to calculate the parts inventory. You know, I, I've heard a couple of your shows recently talking about the supply chain issues and whether or not that's improving. It seems to be kind of a regional thing, whether or not supply chain is improving. But it is a consensus that the price of parts is like pretty astronomical across mm -hmm. across all of Canada. And so not only is it a supply issue and a price issue, but farmers are looking at you know, the downtime if we have to wait for those parts to come in, those expensive parts to come in. So we're now in a position where we have parts inventories on the farm. You know, around here, we could be looking at you know, close to 10 bucks an acre just in parts inventory sitting around. Mm -hmm. And off, you know, I flip around between thinking that number is just astronomical and then trying to do the bar napkin math on waiting for parts. You know, if you're waiting 24 hours for a part, and that's not unusual when you live in Moss Bank, Saskatchewan, you're going to wait for some time. Uh, you're looking at, you know, that in, in terms of seeding, that could be five or five or 600 acres of downtime, you know, back to the productivity conversation. Spraying, you could have lost 1,500 acres spraying, you know, combine and same two or 300 acres of combining in a day. So that those productivity numbers really come into play too, which I suppose is me justifying parts inventory on the farm, even though I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Kelvin, it, it is a question of, and we heard that on the farmer amplifier this week as well. That that same you know question of why are parts so expensive versus what they potentially have been, um, and you know there was maybe a bit of a hey, we're also not dealing with the same quality of equipment that we used to get, even though the price tag is way higher. Um, you know, we are seeing certainly, or the trends look like we're well below uh, the five-year average as far as, you know, combine sales, et cetera. Are, I mean, not surprising, but is this a good proxy for how agriculture is doing in general, or is this very much, we've got some major challenges on the equipment side? No, I think it is, uh, it is definitely uh, an indicator of the trend right now and, and where our sector, especially on the crop side of things is headed as, uh, as borrowing costs of course have gone up and uh, and commodity prices the margins are are thinner than they have been in a in a while heading into this growing season and so yeah i, I do think that uh, well association of equipment manufacturers monthly sales data has also shown things slowing down I, I think the only category that has seen higher sales year to date in in canada is the the high horsepower uh tractors and so that's uh, other other categories are down combine sales in Canada down 5% US combine sales down 20% year to date the latest numbers from AEM and so 
that's uh, I, I, I do think that this is and on the parts side of things for I think a lot of equipment dealers are in a tough position right now they're having a huge challenge on the labor side of things in terms of finding staff and technicians and, and mechanics who can who are qualified to work on on equipment. That's an issue that everybody like everybody's dealing with labor shortages, but I think uh, dealers in particular are, are feeling that and then. If their equipment sales are down, but they need to maintain profitability and margins, well, maybe it, some of that uh, revenue side of the equation gets shifted to uh, the the shop and parts and and repairs and and that side of things. So, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it could be a difficult situation. And I think, like Sherilyn said, a lot of farmers are feeling their risk management approach here has to be to uh, ensure that you have some of those key parts on the farm and maybe even somebody that knows how to fix them. Uh, on the farm because uh, it's difficult to to sometimes find a, a mechanic that can work on it in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Sherilyn, you used the comment just before we went on air. Um, it's a problem that you can't wait for somebody else to fix, so you're just going to have to deal with it and do it yourself, meaning exactly that. Bump up your parts inventory, get those orders in when you don't need them, and keep them. Um, but as you mentioned, it's an expensive one. Um, so it it definitely becomes yet another sort of costs that the farm has to bear, right, to stay rolling, um, which, you know, if you're a planner, that's great. If you fly by to your studio pants, I think this is going to be a tough year. But when margins get as tight as they are right now, then we hope to be as efficient and as productive as we possibly can every hour of the day, every dollar that we spend. And when the price, when when input costs are so high, we're just being you know as diligent as we possibly can, and as innovative as our equipment has gotten. I mean, worldwide innovation on farm today is just is a true, truly awesome story to tell. But an auger broke down can stop everything. <laughs> a broken right. belt can just stop everything. So yeah. it isn't always just the super innovation that keeps us going. That it's your regular parts that have to be on hand. Uh, you know, an alternator. We just are stocking alternators because if that goes, yeah. uh, you're slowed up. So you know, it's a bit of a yeah. catch twenty two. So, but it also like sort of further into that discussion or just that comment of you know, okay, so fewer international students funding some of our college programs or our university programs. Do we? We are talking about, and Kelvin mentioned it too, you have to have someone who's actually able to fix things that you need to do. And as an observation, if anyone's seen our shop series, one of the things that I think each shop has had is all the hydraulic hoses. They do all their own fittings and all their own. That I think has been like across the board. And that's like one of the first things that as you expand, you have to do. Because like, Sherilyn, to your point, time is so expensive to lose. To lose a day at seeding or harvest is just unacceptable. And especially if it's something like a belt or a hose or whatever. Um, but it does go all the way up to much larger fixes that you have to have people capable of doing it. And we don't necessarily have an excess of that knowledge out there. And so I, I for one, am a little concerned um, from the training perspective of we need to be really strategic on what we continue to support as far as programming for what we need as a country to keep rolling. Okay, uh, let's pause just, just there. On that, Lindsay, oh, go ahead. Just yep. that, it really comes down to risk mitigation. Yep. And as farmers are looking at what we can control in terms of our risk, just having things on hand so that yep. we are less reliant on somebody else, whether that is crop protection products, all your chemicals on, on farm, extra fuel on farm. We used to be able to just roll with it, you know, give a call yep. to the fuel truck, come on out, we're almost empty. And now we just cannot risk reliance on you know the, those short-term asks and so as part of our ability to try to mitigate risk when we can't mitigate weather uh, maybe we've gone too far that in that direction but it feels like a necessity right now absolutely okay let's take a quick break and we'll be back with more of the real Ag issues panel right after this Does your end stabilizer contain an active ingredient load high enough to be agronomically effective? If not, it could be costing you time and money. If you're putting down a nitrogen stabilizer, put your trust in Coke Agronomic Services. Solutions like SuperU, Tribune, and Anvil. Each delivers high active ingredient concentrations that low rate products just can't match. Compare how imitator products stack up to agronomically effective solutions at defendyourn.ca. 
I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. It is Friday. It is the issues panel. And for balanced nutrition with micronutrients, the best answer is Wolf Tracks DDP from Coke Agronomic Services. To learn how Wolf Tracks can ensure nutrient availability through a crop's growth cycle, visit CokeEgg.ca. That's Coke, K O C H, egg.ca. All right, let's wrap it up here, friends. We've got about nine minutes to fill. And oh my gosh, we got lots to talk about. Sherilyn, Jolly Nagel out of Moss Bank, Saskatchewan, Kelvin Hepner out of Altona, Manitoba. Let's start with, Kelvin, I'll start with you. Doug Chorney retires this week, I think, or is he already done? I think we're having a party for him this uh, today. I think there's a, yeah, there's yeah. a party happening for him today, I think, at the Canadian Grain Commission in, uh, in Winnipeg. Uh, officially, I think he's on the job as chief commissioner until April 30th, so a couple more days. But uh, yeah. Uh, Lawrence McCauley, the federal ag minister, announced this week that David Hunt has been appointed as uh, the new chief commissioner of uh, the Canadian Grain Commission. As Chorney had announced a couple months ago that uh, he hadn't reapplied, wasn't seeking to have another term uh, leading the the grain regulator. And so, uh, yeah, we're going to have a change atop the, the CGC and we'll see what that means in terms of uh, any uh, progress on, uh, on this Canada Grain Act review that uh, uh, Chorney pushed on, but it, it certainly hasn't uh, gone as far as what uh, a lot of people in, in the grain sector would like to see in terms of progress on, on that file. Now, Sherilyn, I would assume that you know Doug and maybe in the capacity of the Grain Commission or not in the capacity. He also farms uh, just outside of Winnipeg. Um, any well wishes for Doug on his way? Oh, absolutely. I worked with Doug in a number of capacities. I don't think he came on as Chief Commissioner till after I'd step down as president of the wheat growers, but we did work together in various capacities. You know, it's it's funny for me to reflect because I was with the wheat growers for 20 plus years and a, I would run into a lot of the same people and you'd have to read their name tag to find out which company or which organization, which association they were with at the time. And I thought at the time that it was a bit incestual. Like, why are we just recycling people into different organizations? And then I just became one of those people that went from different organizations. Uh, and I don't see it as such a negative thing anymore because the learning curve inside agricultural policy it is really steep. And once you feel like you've got a grasp or a handle on some of those issues, then you feel like you have an opportunity to contribute and make a difference and move the needle. By the end of my 20 years with the wheat growers, I finally felt confident and comfortable, like I understood some of the issues. So I appreciate what Doug did for the industry for certain. And I'm, I'm always very grateful, no matter which side of the argument anyone was on, when farmers especially step up and they take the time, the commitment, the energy into you know, being involved in agricultural policy in some capacities. I'm very grateful for that. So I wish him the best and, and I have a lot of gratitude for him. Mm -hmm. I will okay. second that too, Lindsay, in terms of wishing Doug well, as he, uh, I think he's planning to do some more fishing and, and golfing this summer, in addition to actually focusing on his, on his farm, which uh, uh, he's obviously dedicated a lot of hours to his uh, industry service the last number of years. So yeah, I, I, Doug's one of the people that I've probably interviewed the most and interacted the most in terms of egg policy and, and farm groups over the last 10, 15 years. So yep. yeah, I want to wish him all the best. Yeah, absolutely. And and Sherilyn, to your point, and Kelvin, as you as well, I mean, it is, especially when you also farm, uh, it takes a lot of dedication to wanting to do well, wanting to make things better, and recognizing it's going to take time away from maybe what you would rather be doing, like actually putting your crop in the ground or, or those sorts of things. So it takes a lot of sacrifice, and we do appreciate it, Doug. So all the best uh, in your, I, I don't think it will be the last we see of him. No, I hope we see him it's a, Yeah, uh, but I'm sure he's going to enjoy his year of farming. And, uh, and of course, welcome to David Hunt. We'll see, we'll see if this actually uh, moves anything forward on the, on the Canada Grain Act review. 
Uh, that's not his decision, I don't think, uh, as we've seen. So I'm not holding my breath. Okay, we got a couple minutes left. Uh, didn't want to end the week without mentioning uh, the Bungie Viterra merger uh, or proposed merger. The Competition Bureau, uh, Calvin, it, here in Canada, not rosy language regarding how they felt this could go forward. So this is, of course, not a, a judgment per se, but where do we sit with this? It's it's a judgment, but not a binding judgment or right. a ruling. So yeah, the Competition Bureau came up with its report this week uh, on on this acquisition, which was announced last June. It's almost almost a year ago already. Uh, and uh, this report from the Competition Bureau raises quote substantial competition concerns uh, regarding Bungie's acquisition of Viterra, and a lot of these have to do with the pressure that this could put on canola prices in parts of Western Canada, including in my backyard here in southern Manitoba, uh, related to competition for canola around crush facilities that uh, that Bungie owns. So that's one of the issues uh, the Competition Bureau raised. Also, some concerns around the supply of processed or refined canola oil in eastern Canada. Uh, what this merger with Bungie's uh, existing ownership stake in G3, what that could mean. So to me, overall, the language was stronger than I expected and uh, surprisingly strongly worded in terms of uh, the Competition Bureau voicing concerns here. Uh, a lot of people in industry said, have been telling us that they don't really see many huge overlap issues in terms of reducing competition here that would raise regulatory concerns. But uh, this was uh, it may be in line with the broader social and political environment or atmosphere these days where there it seems there is uh, appetite for cracking down on consolidation. And, uh, and maybe that's where the Competition Bureau and the co commissioner there are feeling more licensed to uh, exert their, uh, their pressure. Again, though, this isn't binding. It will be used to inform the transport minister's decision on, uh, on whether to allow this deal to go ahead and whether there should be conditions attached, which I expect there will be some. Uh, so that ultimately that transport minister and federal cabinet decision has yet to come and the stats can report or sorry not stats can competition bureau agency uh report that was published this week uh will will inform that federal government decision mm -hmm. Sherilyn, were you uh, at all surprised by the the strength of the language in it and I, I think i was as well but at the same time i really didn't think they were just going to be like yeah everything's rosy i'm not surprised they do have criticisms yeah, I'm actually quite grateful for it as well. I mean, anybody who knows me knows I really try to live by my free market principles. So I try not to be hypocritical when I go into, you know, exploring an issue like this. I don't want to stifle innovation. I don't want to stifle business uh, or stifle those kinds of relationships and that investment that these com but both of all three of these companies are making in, in Canada. At the same time, you can't have a free market without competition. So I'm grateful that we have a fairly robust competition bureau. Over my time with the wheat growers, we, we played intervener status in several situations, and we brought our organization's thoughts and our memberships, you know, opinions to the table as it related to any, any form of merger. And for a while there, we went through a lot of them. You know, there was UGG yeah. and AgriCore United and Viterra and Cargo. There was a whole lot. There, it also exists on the retail side. So this grain buying side, processing side, and retailing side. And I'm, I'm very grateful that we have a robust competition bureau. I think it was the real ag poll that you guys did not too long ago that said 70% of farmers who responded to your poll really felt like this merger was not good for, I don't know if it was not good for agriculture or specifically not good for farmers. But 70% of the respondents felt that this was not a good idea. So it, it, um, I, I, I agree with them on that one. Mm -hmm. Strict okay. lens is a good thing. Yep. So we'll see where it goes. We'll definitely be keeping track of that. That's all the time we've got for today here on the Real Egg Issues panel. Thank you all for listening here on Real Egg Radio. We do appreciate it. Uh, we'll talk to you on Tuesday. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this Relay Radio podcast brought to you by Corrigin Max Insecticide from FMC. When you need to protect your crops from damaging insects, Corrigin Max Insecticide delivers fast, selective, extended control of grasshoppers, bertha armyworms, diamondback moth, cutworms, and more. Ask your retailer today.